bid you a good morning. Good morning. I made a comment to the pastor that I was very thankful that the song was not sung prior to me preaching. Because his eye is only sparrow is a personal song to me. It is something that touches my heart in ways I could not describe with the language of human. It is a, a song that is my testimony. Because when you think about what the words are saying, his eye is on his barrel. And you realize that as individual as we are, God is still about each and every one of us. In love and in trust and he trusted us to be a part of this family. And that is something that is extremely special to me personally as a minister and as a Christian and as a member of the family. Uh, so I was thankful that I was able to take a breath after the song was sung. And I don't even know if Pat realized how important and how much that song means to me. Having said that, I want to bid you again a good morning. It is really nice to see so many of you. Uh, we have not been here for a while. And um, let me say this, that there were challenges, and then there are challenges. Uh, there were some unseen forces, it appeared, that tried to stop us from coming here today. All the way up until this morning, there were things going on. And without being going into them individually, God is good. Amen. God is very good. Um, he is extremely good. And we always say that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And so it is really, really good to see each and every one of you on behalf of my entire family. I thank you for inviting us and taking care of us uh, on and before we got here. So uh, that is important. The scripture uh, today, taken out of the book of Mark, is a prelude to what this sermon is about. The title of the sermon, I titled it, Everyone is Welcome, But Everyone is Not Family. This seems to be a shock to some of us. Because we would think that everyone in the church is family. The word family is something that a lot of us take for granted. Because when you say family, so most of us think, well, wait a minute, what does family mean? Does this mean that a group of people that are joined together through a common thread, is that what we call family? Does family mean a group of people who are together by blood relation? Does that mean family? Does it mean family when we say we all just simply love each other? Is that what we mean by family? But according to the Bible, that's not what family is. And today in the church, we're really extremely divided on the issue of family. You wouldn't think we would be, but we are. I want to let you know that there is a state that passed a law recently. This law takes effect on July 1st this year. This law says that from now on, from that day on, if someone comes in a restaurant and you do not agree religiously with the makeup of their family, they can refuse to be serviced. This is a law. It was passed by the state. I don't want to say what state it was, it doesn't really matter, because these things are becoming universal. There's an issue going on in our country, in our nation, and even in our church that is dividing people on the basis of what we religiously call family. It's amazing that this is going on. And it is getting worse. There's another state that passed a law. And this is not some speculation. This is a law. And the law says that if you are someone who is what they consider a transgender, you cannot use public facilities. 
In other words, the man has to go into the men's room, the women have to go into the women's room. There cannot be any diversity in this. This is a law in the state of North Carolina. I'm saying all this as a prelude to understand what does the Bible call family? Why is it that we can open up the doors to the church, welcome everybody, love everyone, but understand that everybody is not family? When Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, who is he coming back for? He's coming back for his family. Is he coming back for everybody? No. He's not coming back for everybody. He's coming back for his family. So the question goes back to, well, who's family? Who is our family? You know, I'll tell you something. And I hope you don't mind me mentioning his name. But uh, Ricky is my brother. And I love him very, very much. He calls me regularly. We have prayed together. We have argued together. And, and arguing in love means that it doesn't matter who wins, we both win. Because when it ends up, we end up saying, well, what does God say? That's how you argue with somebody you love. When you put it on God. Say, well, let God decide who's right and who's wrong. So you can still love your brother when it's over. But I love Ricky very much. And when someone asks, well, who's Ricky? I said, well, Ricky is my brother. He's my family. He's not just a member of the church. He's not just another man that I know. He's my brother. He's family. When I mention anyone in the Simmons family, they're family to me. Amen. I love each and every one of them. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. We are connected spiritually. They're my family. Just as if we were born of the same mother and the same father. They're my family. And there are several of you that's in the category of family, but I'm afraid to say everybody is not family. Now, before I go further, I want to cover something before we go to Scripture. In order to be family, there are three things that you have to understand. The first thing is that to be family is a choice. You choose to be family. In other words, we can't pick and choose who's family. There are some instances, and there are some even churches, that are deciding who is and who is not family. You know, when the pastor mentioned that there was a vote for membership. Now we have to understand there's a difference between voting for membership and voting someone in or out of the family. You can do one, but you cannot do the other. Because we do not decide who is in our family. The Bible is very clear very clear that a choice has to be made. We have the will of God to decide whether or not we are going to be part of his family. So we cannot force anyone to be in the family. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. There are members of your family that are not members of this church. I'll say that again. There are members of this family that are not members of this church. The Bible says clearly my, my sheep are from other folks. <clears throat> so being a part of the family of Christ is not necessarily saying you have to be a member of this church. Now here's the third one. And some of y'all may have a problem with this. Once you are in the family, it does not mean that you stay in the family. Just as if you have a choice to come in the family, you have a choice to be out of it. Now we get to the real problem in the church today. There are people here in the church that come to worship God, but that are not members of the family. They're not members of the family. And it's okay if you're not, because our goal here is to bring you back to the family. See, here's the issue. We have a mother and we have a father. And we have a children, the children. And spiritually, we have to know who is who. If you go back to the book of Genesis, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created man, let's do this, let's ask the question. We're talking spiritually. Who's the father? God is 
the Father, our Creator and our Redeemer. He's, our, he's the Father. Who's the mother? We're well, getting silent. Who's the mother? Okay, the church is the mother. Okay? All right. The Bible says the church is the mother, okay? Who's the children? Okay, let me ask you this. If we're the children, then who's the church? Are we confused? I want to understand something. And I'm not here to confuse anybody. Individually, individually, you're the children. Collectively, you're the church. Amen. Everybody hear me? Individually, you're the children of God. Collectively, we're the church. This is how it was in the beginning. And understand something else. In the beginning, your carnal father and your spiritual father was the same. Everybody hear me? Our carnal father and our spiritual father was the same. Today, in the church, there is a movement going on that says that our carnal father is not our eternal father. The children are confused. Who's daddy? When we have homes, uh, what we call broken homes, is when parents are split up and the children are confused. Who's daddy? Who is my father? If we do not know who our spiritual father is, we barely know who our carnal father is, how can we possibly do the will of God in a state of confusion? You see, you got to remember something. What Satan did to the church, the first thing Satan did was he discredited the Father. Did everybody understand that? In the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, what did Satan tell Eve? Do we need to turn to it? Everybody turn to, uh, turn to Genesis. I'll show you this. Turn to Genesis chapter number 2. The book of Genesis, chapter 2. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Just start chapter 3. Genesis, chapter 3. Everybody got that? Genesis, chapter 3. Verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse number four. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God know, for God do know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What did the Satan do to the woman? What did he do to God when he told Eve, You should not surely die? He was discredited the Father by accusing God of lying. Or withholding something from me and Adam. See, whenever you want to break up a family, the first thing you do is discredit the father. And you tell me, is this going on in some of our homes? Is this going on in some of our churches? Our fathers are being discredited. If the father is discredited, then what happens to the leadership of that home? The children are in disarray. Now we get to the mother. What did Satan do to the mother? The Bible says Eve was deceived. And all during the, uh, the dark ages, even up until today, Satan is tormenting the woman. He's tormenting the church. What did the Bible say in the book of Revelation? That the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Our mothers are being attacked emotionally and psychologically. They're being attacked. It's really easy to sit on the outside and say, oh, you, you just pray it through. It'll be all right. But mothers are emotional. They have no problem with loving their children. 
It doesn't matter if the child is obedient or disobedient to a mother. A mother always loves a child. And when Satan uses the emotion that a mother has to torment her, to get you to listen to what your emotions are saying and not the will of God, we got a problem in the church. Because we love our children, don't we? You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, uh, train up a child where they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from them. And I know we have parents in here that will say, wait a minute, I know the Bible says that. I raised my child in the church, yet my child is rebellious, yet my child is doing things that we didn't teach them. What is going on with my child? Am I a bad parent? Did I do something wrong? Is it my fault that I raised my child in a Christian home, yet my child is doing things that I definitely did not teach them to do? What did I do wrong as a parent? I too am a parent. I understand. What does that scripture really mean? Here's what it means. And I want everybody to hear me on this. When the Bible says train up a child and where they should go, here's what the Bible is talking about. Whatever you put into the heart of your children will not leave. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. If you put it into your child, then the power of the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to them, whether it's today, tomorrow, or whenever. It is up to the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. But you have to understand something, parents. When you have a three-year-old that won't obey, that's an easy problem to solve. When you have a 33-year-old that won't obey, whose choice is it? See, sometimes we struggle as parents because we love our children and we want to guide them. We want them to have the best of life. We see what is the result of their decisions, and it hurts us in our hearts. Think of what God is doing for us. Think of that. God is saying to us, well, these are my children. I'm giving them my word. They're disobedient. They're doing their own thing. It hurts. But you have to understand something, parents. At 33 years old, you have to understand there's a free will. We have to love one and not the other. That means that if we have a free will, we have to respect the free will. We can't make choices for our children. Sometimes you have to love them from a distance. What's Joshua 24, 15? Somebody look that up for me. Joshua 24, 15. We love our children. We do. But sometimes you got to let them go. You got to let them make their own decisions. Because remember, we're talking about the family. You have to want to be here. You have to choose to be here. And you have to choose to be obedient to the will of the Father. If our fathers are in place, in the homes and in the church. Then our leadership can move forward. If we are not in place, we got a problem. What is Joshua 24, 15? Somebody read it. And if it seems evil to you mm -hmm. to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. If the Father is in place, if the Father is not discredited, if the Father is serving God, everybody in this household should be serving God. Amen. If you are not serving God, you shouldn't be in my house. Sometimes that's tough to be telling parents. But some of us got some, some people in our house that's not serving God. And we know they're not serving God. And we are struggling, emotionally struggling, spiritually struggling, while I have no prayers left to pray for my children. What am I supposed to do? When Jesus Christ came into the temple, 
And people were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. What did he do? They had to do it. And he wasn't polite. Sometimes we got to let our children go. And what I'm really saying is sometimes we have to let family members go. Because if they chose not to be here, they shouldn't be here. It's hard, but we have to do it. Because you got to want to be here. As you be in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So how do you decide whether or not you're in this family? This family, this body of believers. How do we go back to our originally that we had one father? See, our corner father is our connection to our spiritual father. What happened to that? See, if the pastor of this house is in an anointed position, and if he is under the will of the Father, then everyone in the house, everyone in the church is blessed by their pastor. Or should I say blessed through their pastor? But if he's not in place. See, this goes to who is in positions of credibility or who's in a position of anointing. Uh -oh. When we're selecting people for leadership in the church, is it based on status or is it based on anointing? <coughs> See, like I said earlier, there's a movement going on. And I'll just talk about this briefly because it has to do with family. We're being told who our family is. This movement is very, very intriguing. Is a large movement that's going on. And it affects even the church, especially the church. This entire year of 2000 and, uh, 2016 is what they call a, a jubilee year. And I don't know if anybody knows what that means. To make a, a, a short of it, it means that we can all become members of the same family regardless of our doctoral issues. Regardless of our denominational issues. Come on back to the family. But what is Isaiah 8.20? What does Isaiah 8.20 say? See, all unity is not good unity. This movement that's going around is saying, hey, come back to the family. It's all on the internet. It's on every social media. It is in every country, pretty much. And it's saying, come back to the family. But the, one of the criteria that should determine whether you are a member of any family should be Isaiah 8.20. What is Isaiah 8.20? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony. If it speaks not according to the word, there's no light in it. Every unity, every family member is subject to the will of the Father. If it is not according to this word, then we shouldn't be a part of it. No matter how popular it is, no matter how much money they throw at you, no matter the entertainment value of it, we're not part of it. Can you buy a blessing? Can you train for a blessing? Can you force somebody to give you a blessing? Can you legislate blessings? Uh-oh. See, it, it, we, this is why I brought up these laws that's changed. When morality is governed by law, what is happening in the church? You see, when we cannot decide what is right or wrong in the church, and we are asking the government to decide what's right and wrong, something is wrong here. We are headed for destruction. There is very little time left. Very little time. I would love to preach on Bible prophecy. And to let all of you all know that there are some current events that's lining up with Bible prophecy. This is almost over. We are at the very emergence of the mark of the beast. Amen. 
And if you don't know whose family you're in, you will be deceived. The Bible says that if we're not careful, even the elect can be deceived. So how do you know whose family you're in? It's easy for us to put on our clothes and come in and be nice to each other for five minutes and act like your family. But who's really family? Everybody turn, please, to Matthew chapter number five. In Matthew chapter five, I'm going to show you what Jesus Christ said is family. In Matthew chapter 5, these are what we call the Beatitudes. When the first uh, Sermon on the Mount. Alright? Because understand something about family. Family is not a title. Just as love is not an emotion spiritually. Love is a character building. It's a character trait. As we develop the character of God, we can love each other. The only way you can forgive each other is through the love of God. The only way you can love your enemy is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the love of God. This is why you can have every spiritual gift, but if you don't love your brother, what good is it? There's many of us. You can look on TV, on the internet, you can look on social media and find all kinds of people who can quote every scripture, but there's no love in them. What good is it? In Matthew chapter 5, on the Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say? What is, let me read this here. And seeing the multitude, he went up, this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, unto the mountain, and when he sat, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And it goes on. And we need to understand, to be a member of the family, these are the traits of love that should be displayed. You know ye by the love we show one to the other. When you have a new member saying, I'm a member of this church because of the love that was shown to me. That reason that that sounds familiar to me is because that's the reason I'm in this church. And I'm telling you now, had we not been shown that, we wouldn't be here. And I don't want to sound selfish, but it's not the doctrine of the Bible that we're turning people away from. It's not the truth that's being exposed that's turning people away. It's our attitudes of not loving our brothers and our sisters. Amen. Because trust me, love will draw more people to this church than any doctrinal truth you can have in the Bible. Amen. Because until they know you love them, they don't care what you know. And if you don't love them, they don't care what you know. They're out of here. Now, I don't mean to come back from not being here a while and think that I'm chastising those that I just said I love. But I'm here to let you know, time is running out. Amen. We, have, we have got to be about our Father's business. And some of us are not. Some of us in the family are not acting like we're in the family. Some of us are acting like we got our own families. The children of Israel tried that. Moses took a little bit too long. Sermon didn't last, it didn't last too long. He was gone too long. What did they decide to do? Well, let's do our own thing. Some of us have got children who are doing their own thing. We know it's not right. We know the results. But they're not listening. And it's agonizing, it's torment to us. And I'm talking about in the church. What do we do when we don't get along in the church? Do we let God solve the problem? Do we let the word of God settle the issue? Well, you think you know more than him. Is it a matter of who's right and who's wrong? Or is it a matter of who loves and who don't? We need more love unless I'm right in the church. Amen. You want to grow? We need to. Because remember, there are two kinds of spiritual growth.
growth. There is the eternal growth that happens inside you, which are personal relationship with God. Then there's the external growth, which is how we deal one to the other. If you're growing in one and not the other, we got a problem. That's like in spirit, but not in truth. Or even truth and not in spirit. You need them both. And we should be maturing in both. And we should be helping our brothers and sisters.